right. Now looks good. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Savidyan Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastuma Vidvi Shavahai Om Shanti 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 Om Good. Welcome to all of you. Glad to have you here for satsang. Welcome also to all the uh, students who attend these uh, sessions online. It's been uh, quite nice to be able to take questions from all of our uh, remote students in addition to our, to our local students. And what we'll do today, as we've done in prior satsangs, is we'll take questions from both our local students here and from our online students. So let me begin with uh, some online questions and then we'll alternate. Uh, first question is from Arju, who lives in uh, Seattle. <coughs> so, <loud. coughs> so Arju asks, after an individual has realized and established himself in his true, unlimited, unborn identity as Satchitananda Atma, being identical with Brahman, why do they bother, and I'm kind of putting a word here, why do they bother performing, or why would they bother performing puja or doing other devotional activities after gaining enlightenment? So the, that's a really quite a good, good question. We understand bhakti in a twofold way, apara bhakti and para bhakti. Apara bhakti, the lower bhakti, if you can call it lower, is bhakti as a spiritual practice. You do s devotional activities. You undertake devotional activities for the sake of purifying your mind and heart, for the sake of preparing you for enlightenment. Then, after if you have performed these devotional practices for years and years and years, and then you become enlightened, will you suddenly become allergic to all these devotional practices? That doesn't make sense, right? So, an enlightened person then has para-bhakti. The bhakti con continues, the devotional activities continue but at a different level. I think in the Narada Bhakti Sutras that Pada Bhakti is called Ananya Bhakti, a devotion in which you recognize your non-separateness from Bhagavan. Okay, question from Daniel, who lives in the Philippines. What is the difference between God experience and self-realization. So here we have a little, uh, partially it's a language problem. So God, uh, God realization, I'm trying to think of, to do, to do the reverse translation. God realization is a translation of what Sanskrit <laughs> expression? and perhaps Ishura Sakshatkara, to have the immediate experience of Ishura, God of the cosmos. In scriptures, there are so many stories about saints for whom Lord Vishnu or Shiva or some other aspect of God appears before them. So that would be the more traditional way of understanding what, what he calls God experience. Problem is, the English term God experience has been connected to enlightenment. And that's what Daniel means it here in the sense of enlightenment. He doesn't mean it in the sense of Narada or some other, day, some other uh, ancient saint seeing, having darshan 
of, of some aspect of God. So that's not his orientation, but using that term God experience in a modern sense to mean enlightenment. And as a term for enlightenment, it's really flawed. God experience. Is enlightenment an experience? We've had this discussion. Enlightenment cannot be an experience because experiences come and go. Full stop. Whatever you Whatever experience you have, some kind of God experience, fine. And what happens when your God experience is over? <laughs> then you're not enlightened anymore. So the second expression he uses, self-realization, atma sakshatkara, or atma jnanam, atma vidya, um, these terms are much more meaningful. The discovery of your true nature, Atma. So, little little problem with language. We'll take one more question here, and then we'll take your questions. Um, this question is from Pyle, who lives in Karnataka. After attaining the experience of witness consciousness, just curious if it's coming from there. After attaining the experience of witness consciousness or sakshi bhava, what should we do to proceed further in spiritual life and attain enlightenment? Th this is a very common uh, problem. Sakshi bhava, of course, means a particular, usually meditative state in which you feel like the detached observer of the activities taking place in your mind. To be a detached observer of the activities of your mind is generally called Sakshi Bhava. So you can have that experience in meditation. It's a very helpful experience. And as we just discussed, like any other experience, it comes to an end. Your meditation comes to an end. You get up and Sakshi Bhava is gone. So what should you continue to do for the sake of enlightenment? Well, first of all, you recognize that Sakshi Bhava isn't enough. And for that reason, we have this whole body of spiritual teachings called Advaita Vedanta, which are meant to lead you step by step by step to personally discover your true nature as Satchirananda Atma. So there is, it's a, there is a methodology, a process that you undergo in which your attention is turned within for the sake of discovering your true nature. Okay, let us Switch gears now and take a question from inside here. Raise your hand and we'll give you the microphone. Any questions? A question here. Namaste Swamiji. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, uh, many neuro, neuro uh, scientists like Walter Penfield and Persinger and Olaf Planke and many others hmm. uh, have conducted experiments where they are able to kind of induce, like electromagnetically, as with impulses to induce experiences like the vision of God and out-of-body experiences and many, uh, many experiences that uh, spiritual people would call uh, like divine experiences. So what do you think, what is the role of brain in uh, this kind of experiences? Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Um, so there are modern techniques using, uh, is it magnetic stimulation and mostly magnetic. They, they introduce a pulse of magnetism through your skull. F good part is it's non-invasive. They're not sticking <laughs> th anything through your skull into your brain. I don't think you're ready for that. So what they've been doing in a laboratory 
is inducing, uh, putting pulses of electromagnetic energy into your uh, brain, penetrates the skull, and it causes some things to happen depending on where they focus that, that energy. And they can demonstrate, perhaps, the ability to induce mystical experience. We'll call it, you can call it whatever you want, for our sake of our discussion, we'll say they induce some kind of spiritual or mystical experience. Well, that to me sounds quite familiar. Yeah, I've made this uh, admission before in the 1960s, part of our hippie culture of that time, I was a young, stupid kid, and I took LSD. I'm not justifying it. I said young, stupid kid. So don't get me wrong, I'm not justifying it. But I'm saying it's kind of the same thing. Whether you induce this spiritual experience with this magnetic coil, or if you induce a spiritual experience with LSD, or, watch this one, if you induce a spiritual experience with meditation. How different is it? Different, is it? You're inducing a spiritual experience. Wonderful! <laughs> the experience comes, the experience goes. The experience may inspire you to stay on a spiritual path. It may not, but the <laughs> you're simply invoking spiritual experiences. Some psychologist, I forget who, made a big deal out of the fact that a portion of our mind, I think they did this, um, this uh, what functional MRI, and they had some meditator go into the machine and they scanned the brain to see what lit up. And they discovered that there's a certain place in your brain that's associated with spiritual experiences. I don't understand why that's such a big deal. <laughs> Honestly, so what? Whether it's here or here or here, <laughs> tell me what difference does it make? The fact is, is that our brains host the activities of our minds. Our minds are capable of having these spiritual experiences. Wonderful. This is nature as, as it is. So um, it seems to me that some researchers, what is it, overhype <laughs> the, their, these kinds of experiments. Of course, they're bound to overhype because scientists need to get grants to fund their research, <laughs> and they're only going to get those grants if they hype <laughs> their, <laughs> their Okay, any follow-up? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I turned it down. Mm -hmm. yes. So, uh, my another question is about uh, free will. Um, in the same manner, like, neuroscientists uh, can demonstrate that in many cases, uh, the pr process of decision-making sometimes happens, happens even in advance before we are aware of the decision that we are making. So is there any free will, like genuine free will, or everything is like nature, as even Bhagavad, in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says mm -hmm. that everything is done by nature. Then where is our role to make decision and go on spiritual paths or don't go? This is a modern challenge to the existence Thank you. <laughs> I'm consistent. <laughs> consistent and not pushing the right button. <coughs> okay. Um, 
This is quite an interesting scientific finding. And what they've demonstrated, it's a pretty amazing finding, that they've demonstrated that before you are aware of making a decision, a mental activity, a can't call it mental activity, a brain activity has already taken place. And as a result of that brain activity, you experience the making of a decision. Okay, this is a uh, it's good research, it's important research, and it helps us really understand how the brain and mind work. Now, they use this, however, as an argument to dismiss free will, and I think this is where the error lies. To demonstrate that the brain is involved in decision-making, that's hardly earth-shattering uh, discovery, right? because everything that happens in the mind is supported by the brain. The brain is a host, mind functions according to the brain. Your decision-making takes place in your mind. Remember, we've had this discussion, Atma makes no decisions. Atma's pure, unchanging consciousness doesn't do anything, not involved in, in activities. Mind makes a decision, the mind being hosted by the brain, naturally we're going to find brain activities associated with decision-making. Their point, though, is that the brain activity precedes the point, and here's, actually, there's a, there's a uh, error here. And, and I haven't thought about this for a long time, so I'm, I, I looked at, I read these articles years ago. <coughs> so let's see if I get it right. The brain activity occurs here. They measure. The brain makes a decision here, and then you record making the decision here. They put you in this, F this machine, you push a button and say, this is when I made the decision. And what they can detect is your brain made the action before you pushed the button. Does that deny the existence of free will? To me, all that shows is it takes time between the brain doing something and having the experience associated with what the brain does. There's a natural delay in the... In, it, it's interesting. Um, we, we, don't th we think of things as being instantaneous. Nothing. It takes, comparatively, a long time to decide to turn your hand upside down. A computer could do it in, could make a decision to do that in billionths of a second. Not even millions, millions of a second, certainly. Let's call it millions of a second. So suppose in one microsecond, that's reasonable, in one microsecond, a computer can make a decision. It takes you, let's say, what, what would that be? Um, no, actually, the, the time I'm looking for is 100 milliseconds, which is 100 thousand microseconds. <laughs> hundred thousand microseconds. The computer can make that decision in one microsecond. You make that decision in a hundred milliseconds, which I think is a hundred thousand microseconds, if I've got my, my uh, math right here. So the computer is a hundred thousand times faster <laughs> in making decisions than you are. And the reason for that is the computer has all these transistors and connections which are really fast, and you've got this two and a half pounds of jelly <laughs> which responds much more slowly. So that's, they're exploring the nature of the brain. 
as far as I'm concerned, it tells absolutely nothing about free will. <laughs> They're just measuring how, f how fast the brain works and how much time between the brain doing something and your experience of what the brain did. There's always going to be a lag. Now, just to finish off this question, there are many serious, profound challenges to the existence of free will. And if we want to argue the existence of free will, I, I believe that those arguments could go on and on and on and on. I just make two observations here. It doesn't, whether or not free, actually according to Vedanta, we take a very Vedantic standpoint, and that is nothing else in the world is absolutely real. Why should free will <laughs> be absolutely real. That's a typical Vedantic <laughs> re response. Um, but I think a more nuanced response is this. Whether or not free will exists or not, I don't know. But I know two things. One, we experience free will. No one can deny that. And secondly, the whole doctrine of karma is based on free will. And in my mind, this gives us plenty of reason to accept free will. Again, you can go on arguing about it forever, but I think there's this basis. We experience free will, and the doctrine of karma is based on free will. So let us accept it. It's, to me, it's reasonable to accept it. To me, it's unreasonable to reject it. And you should know, you may already know, that there are some Vedanta teachers that reject the existence of free will. And they do so because of a confusion. They say, Atma, Atma has no free will. Therefore, free will doesn't exist. Wait a minute. <laughs> what kind of argument is that? Consciousness has no weight. Therefore, nothing in the world has weight. That's not a logical statement, but this is, this is an error in thinking that a handful of Vedanta teachers, including some well-known ones, they have adopted this, 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 I think, defective teaching. Consciousness has no free will, therefore free will does not exist. And I think that's just an error in thinking. Okay, let's take another question uh, here. Question here, take the microphone, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did the uh, button on the bottom get pushed somehow? Push the button on the bottom for 10 seconds. Or give, give me the microphone. Maybe we're going to give up on this microphone again. I don't know why. So the microphone went off. I don't know why. <laughs> the microphone has failed again. <laughs> That's why. OK, what is your question, please? Right. And guna make guna are the one who makes you do what it is, and there, there is no free will, right? Gunas are the one acting. W gunas act, but that does not mean there is no free will. So the question is in the Bhagavad Gita and elsewhere, it is said that everything in the world takes place according to the function of the three gunas. One of the three gunas is sattva guna, which is a principle of intelligence, which can include free will. Why not? Why would, you know, three gunas, just to say that everything's made of three gunas, therefore there's no free will, what, what are these gunas? <laughs> these gunas are the underlying stuff because of which everything exists. If free will exists, 
It exists because of the three gunas, in particular because of sattva guna. Maybe a little rajas because decision making, <laughs> right? And maybe even a little tamas because there's a resistance to decision making. So that whole decision making process is a mental process, right? All mental processes are driven by sattva rajas tamas. So the fact that it's caused by sattva rajas tamas doesn't negate free will. Even when Sri Krishna says everything is, is um, what is the term? Like, like a yantra arudha. I'm going to get his exact words. Like, like a yantra here means a puppet. <coughs> which is arudha, suspended on strings. So Sri Krishna says, whatever happens in the world is like a puppet held on strings. Those strings are sattvrajas <laughs> and tamas. <laughs> so it doesn't mean the negation of free will. It means that your mind is part of nature. And being part of nature, the mind has a special quality of being endowed with free will. That's the way it is. A rock is not endowed with free will. Your mind is endowed with free will. That's the way the world is made, and that's the way sattva rajas tamas are manifest in the world. Okay, let's take uh, some more questions online. This is a question from Thomas, who lives in Detroit. Thomas, um, is it wrong to forgive something? Forgive someone. Someone has hurt you. Is it wrong to forgive them? If someone has inflicted trauma on you and is unremorseful, is it wrong to continue to blame that person and not forgive the person. And we haven't talked about this any time recently, but such an important understanding is it's not a matter of being right or wrong. That's like a moral judgment. Is it morally right or morally wrong? I would say that's beside the point whether it's morally right or morally wrong. The real issue here is what's helpful for you? Because if you fail to forgive that person, who does that hurt? It's so interesting. You bear in your heart this terrible grudge and hate towards the other person. Does that affect the other person at all? They could care less, <laughs> right? That's they're in their behavior. So they don't care that you hate them. But carrying that grudge, that hurt, that resentment inside of you hurts you. So very clearly, forgiveness is not a moral issue. It's a matter of what helps you. Forgiveness helps this is a question from Sumant. Sumant. Uh, the significance of mumukshus, spiritual seekers, should assign, what importance should the uh, Vedantins assign to the doctrine of karma? I've emphas you've emphasized, referring to me, you've emphasized the importance of adhering to the principles that satisfy shruti, yukti, and anubhava, as we've discussed here many times, everything in Vedanta, shruti, scripture, uh, yukti, reasoning, and anubhava, experience. Person uh, Sumant continues, however, it seems to me that the doctrine of karma may not fully satisfy all three. So the doctrine of karma is definitely taught in Shruti. Doctrine of karma is supported by Yukti. We have plenty of reason to support it. But 
we have no way of confirming in terms of our personal experience that the doctrine of karma is correct. You cannot experience, you cannot have an experience which proves the doctrine of karma. Why? Because you experience The doctrine of karma is based on adrishta. Adrishta means not seen, not experienced. It refers to one aspect of karma which takes place, a result that takes place at a later time, in a later, in a different place, and you have no idea. That deferred result technically is called Adrishta. Adrishta unseen means imperceptible, and that which is imperceptible can't be experienced. Show me some. <laughs> Show me some karma. Show me some adrishta. How would you measure it? How would you detect it? So experientially, there's no way to prove. Of course, there's no way to disprove. Both are true. We can't disprove experientially, but there's no way to prove the existence of this adrishta pala, this deferred result of an action. So Sumant is absolutely correct that, that the doctrine of karma is supported by Shruti and Yukti. It is not fully supported by Anubhava. Fine. But that's not Vedanta. <laughs> I said, Vedanta is based on Shruti Yukti Anubhava. What is Vedanta? The simplest way of saying, of summarizing Vedanta is a three word summary, Tattvamasi. The culminating teaching of Vedanta is Tattvamasi. And the meaning of Tattvamasi, you are that, is supported by Shruti Yukti and Anubhava. We're not going to go through that, that's not our topic. Um, the doctrine of karma doesn't satisfy all three, only two out of three, fine, no problem. I mean, Vedanta has that threefold basis. The wisdom of the rishis that can lead you to enlightenment, freedom from suffering, those teachings, those particular teachings indeed are based on Shruti, Yukti, Anubhava, all three. The doctrine of karma is not part of that message. That your true nature is Satchitananda Atma is a fact regardless of the doctrine of karma. If the doctrine of karma is correct or incorrect, it makes no difference. It's irrelevant with regard to the highest teachings of Advaita Vedanta. So strictly speaking, the doctrine of karma is a belief system associated with Vedanta for a purely cultural reason. And that is, Vedanta came up in a Hindu culture that accepted the doctrine of, kar of karma. If Vedanta came up in, in America, <laughs> not possible, but I'm just, just being, being a little silly here. Vedanta could have emerged in a culture that didn't believe in the doctrine of karma, in which case there would be no doctrine of karma. But Vedanta happened to come up in that Hindu culture, which embraces the doctrine of karma, but it's important to know. The doctrine of karma, strictly speaking, is not part of Advaita Vedanta. It accompanies Advaita Vedanta. It's not part of Advaita Vedanta. Here's another question. A question from Mickey. Mickey asks, when doing Nididhyasana, or focusing on myself as Satchitananda, there always seems to be a trace of objectivity 
or a quality to Satchidananda. Although this seems to thin out or get more, more subtle, some quality of an I always remains. Okay. Um, this a, we'll take this as a question about meditation. Not really in Nididhyasana. In Nididhyasana, you're not concerned about experience, to be honest. Nididhyasana is Vedantic contemplation which is meant to fully assimilate these teachings and remove any lingering identification with the body and mind. So Nididhyasana is, is not examining experiences. Nididhyasana is just observing. There are many kinds of Nididhyasana, but in general, in Nididhyasana, you do not get involved with mental activities. You no, no engagement with those mental activities. Here he's talking about an engagement where you are the observer and the mind is observed. That's not Nididhyasana, but that's what Mickey is referring to. And he says there's always some I that remains. The I that remains is ahankara that sense of individuality. Let me try to explain that. <coughs> Suppose you meditate, close your eyes, make your mind quiet, very quiet, perfectly quiet. In that perfectly quiet mind, you might have the sense, I am aware <laughs> of silence. Well, first of all, that thought, I am aware of silence, is not silence. So that thought has come. Your mind is no longer perfectly silence. You're having a feeling. A feeling is a mental activity. To feel like you are observing your mind is a mental activity. Number one. Number two, the I-ness that you're aware of is not Atma. The I-ness you're aware of is a feature of the mind called ahankara, the feeling of individuality. You are the observer of the feeling of I-ness. The observer is your true nature, is consciousness. The I-ness is a feature of the mind known as ahankara, sense of individuality. And to make that clear, let me share with you a metaphor I've used many, an example I've used many, many times to make this idea of sense of individuality very concrete, very experiential. You know, think about a time, many of you have had this experience. If you haven't, then just imagine what it would be like. Imagine listening to your favorite music and you're listening and you're getting drawn in to that music. Deeper and deeper and deeper, you're drawn in. It's very mesmerizing, it's very hypnotic, whatever it is. And you're drawn in to such an extent that you feel like you have disappeared into the music. You have merged into the music. That is the loss of a hankara. That which gets lost in the music, when you say, I got lost in the music, the one that gets lost is that sense of individuality. I'm giving you this example so that you have a more concrete idea. Right now, as we're having this discussion, that sense of individuality is absolutely present. You are an individual person Paying attention, I hope you're paying attention. <laughs> paying attention to you know the, this uh, this discussion. So that sense of of identity, that sense of individuality, let me stay with that, is present in your experience now. That sense of individuality is not present when you are absorbed in the music. What about meditation? Depends. <laughs> most people in most forms of meditation, 
that sense of being the meditator. I am meditating. That's the presence of that sense of individuality. But if you are a little more experienced as a meditator, it's not too hard to get rid of that sense of individuality. When that sense of individuality leaves during meditation, meditation continues without a meditator. Interesting. <laughs> the meditator is gone. Meditation continues. That's a meditative experience. Okay, take one more question here. Um, this is Rajiv, who's in Muscat. Um, I've mentioned that Maya associated with Brahman is what brings about the, the existence of the world, the display of consciousness. We'll call it the uh, emergence of the world. How can Brahman, and his question is, how can Brahman have any association? What is Maya's relationship with Brahman? That which allows it to become sa uh, sarva, he means saguna, Brahman, or Ishvara. There's, this is a little technical, but let, we can understand it fairly simply. Brahman understood, by the way, this is related to another question. I don't know if I can find that question. There are several questions about, about um, Brahman and Maya. And let me, uh, th there are at least two other questions. Let me try to include them in my answer, and then I may see them later. First of all, we, in Advaita Vedanta, we understand Brahman to be nirguna, without qualities, which means that which is without qualities cannot create anything because it doesn't have the quality of being a creator. Brahman does not have the quality of being a creator. One of the questions uh, that, that we'll see perhaps later is the person asks, does, is Brahman the material cause for the universe? Is, in f f we use language like this, everything sarvam brahmamaya, everything is made of brahman, saguna brahman. Anyway, we'll, co we'll come to saguna brahman in a few minutes. Not nirguna brahman. The universe is not made of nirguna brahman because brahman isn't like some kind of stuff you can make anything out of brahman. As I said, nirguna can't do anything, including cannot be the material cause for the universe. Brahman did not, Nirguna Brahman, did not create the universe. Then, from this, this is just, this is Vedanta. Let's have a little fun here. From the standpoint of Brahman, from the standpoint of Nirguna Brahman, there is no universe. There's only Nirguna Brahman. Oh. From the standpoint of this pot, I'm sorry, from the standpoint of clay, there's no pot. There's only clay. If we want, did, did, did anyone invent the clay? Clay is clay. Self-existent clay. I know it's not exactly self-existent, but in our <laughs> metaphor, clay is self-existent. Now, how did that clay create the pot? Clay doesn't <laughs> create the pot. So to understand how the pot exists at all, we have to take a completely different perspective so in which we're not talking about the truth of the clay. We're talking about the appearance of the pot. Notice, we've got two different levels. The truth of the clay and the appearance of the pot. These are two different kinds of reality. 
There's the truth of the clay. There's also the appearance of the pot. And the appearance of the pot is due to some potter who, I think, I think is this handmade? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, but you've probably seen a potter with the wheel going there, and the potter takes a lump of clay, sticks the thumbs inside, and pulls up the edges of the clay. I've done this many when I was a kid. I, I learned how to do that. because It always would fall <laughs> over, but <laughs> that's another thing. Anyway, so there was someone who made this pot, but notice that discussion is from the level of the appearance of pot and not from the level of the truth of clay. So if we want to talk about creation, we have to shift our perspective. If we want to talk about creation, we cannot talk about Nirguna Brahman in the same sentence. This is one of the most common errors people make in their s deeper study of Advaita Vedanta. They try to talk about clay and, metaphorically, they try to talk about clay and pot in one sentence. But these are two levels of reality. You can talk about clay or you can talk about pot. You can talk about underlying reality or you can talk about name and form, but don't get them confused. And that confusion is very common when we talk about Nirguna, Brahman, and then in the same sentence, creation. So this is a confusion. If you're talking about Nirguna, Brahman, the only thing you can refer to is that which is Nirguna, which means no creation. So if we're going to talk about creation, then we, we have to deal with how did this world evolve? Well, there must have been material and intelligence as for any, any reality. There was a material, there was intelligence. That material and intelligence is attributed to Saguna, Brahman, Ishvara. Ishvara has the guna of being a creator Ishvara has the quality of being the material out of which the universe is woven. Ishvara has the quality of possessing the intelligence which allows the, the uh, universe to exist. And then from, this is the last part, a little tricky, watch this. From the standpoint of Saguna Brahman, now we say, where did Saguna Brahman come from? Vedanta <laughs> goes on and on and on like this. Where, how can we explain this Saguna Brahman? And then we say, over here, they talk about Nirguna Brahman. Over here, they talk about Saguna Brahman. How do we explain Saguna Brahman? There must be some other feature because of which Saguna Brahman exists. That feature is called Maya. So Maya is that creative power or faculty possessed by Ishvara through which the universe comes into existence. Now, I'm going to end with one last statement because this gets too technical. And the last statement is this. Nirguna Brahman is not associated with Maya. The problem, because Nirguna Brahman is associated with nothing, there's only Nirguna Brahman. So you cannot say Nirguna Brahman is associated with Maya. But when we teach Advaita Vedanta, a common teaching method is to say that Nirguna Brahman with the creative capacity of Maya is Ishvara. And that is a teaching methodology. It is not a statement of absolute truth. It is how we use words. Brahm, Nirguna Brahman is associated with nothing. Nirguna Brahman is not associated with Maya. Maya, however, is absolutely associated with Saguna Brahman. 
That's where the association lies. Maya is a power wielded by Saguna Brahman. Okay, enough. These questions can get quite, the term is heady. <laughs> heady mean, means just conceptual and, to be honest, at least in my opinion, sometimes not very helpful. Of course, we have these questions and we have to answer these questions, but the real focus of Advaita Vedanta is not dealing with philosophical questions, like how is Brahman associated with Maya? The real essence of Vedanta is how to solve the problem of suffering, how to end this identification with body and mind. Can we give the microphone? Oh no, we have no microphone. Yeah, yeah. go ahead please. So a little bit related question, sir. What does Vedanta say about if we are all such a dhamma, why create this human individual experiences that you have to overcome to get to the reality of you know, what your Satchitananda teaches? Okay, let me repeat the question. The question is, if we are all Satchitananda Atma, then why did we even get into this human form in the first place? Now I'm adding in the first place to make a point. <laughs> Because, according to the doctrine of karma, you have had an infinite number of prior births. There was no first birth, so you never got into this human form or any form in the first place. So, y sorry, but the question turns out to be invalid. We have some such things as invalid questions. You I think you remember the example I gave before of an invalid question. If you ask someone, have you stopped beating your spouse yet? <laughs> so how, how, will you, how will you answer the question? You can't answer the question because it has, an inv it has a wrong assumption. A question that contains a wrong assumption cannot be answered. The question, how did we get a human form in the first place, has a wrong assumption. In the first place. There was no first place. There are an infinite number of prior incarnations without a first incarnation. Does that work for you? It's hard to grab. Yeah, for now. <laughs> and, and it's hard because um, it has this concept of infinity. If you're a mathematician, you understand infinity perfectly well. I have a feeling few of you are <laughs> mathematicians. <laughs> so dealing with infinity is a, is a stretch, so to speak. Okay, another question from our, um, our yes, Sorry. please. Okay. Or is Shakti more identified with just Maya? All right. So the question is the terms. Saguna Brahman. Yes. Ishwara and, Ma and, and Maya. And Maya and Shakti. and Shakti. Okay. So Saguna Brahman and Ishwara are synonyms. Saguna Brahman is a technical term to describe Ishwara the creator, sustainer, destroyer, etc. In common language, God or Bhagavan. Um, what is the relationship with Maya? We would say Maya is a power wielded by Ishvara. Maya is a Shakti wielded by Ishvara. Maya is a shakti wielded by maya. But we're using shakti now in a Vedantic meaning, not in, in you know, the word shakti can also refer to goddess, and that's not our context here. We're using shakti in its root meaning, which means power. So maya is a shakti wielded by Ishvara, which is identical to Saguna Brahman. 
And this kind of question is, is you know, the other question I, I suggested was a little overly philosophical. This one I consider not overly philosophical because it's, and we discussed this in our last class, in our last satsang, it's really important to get our terminology correct. And that certainly is important. We'll take another question here. In back, please. Okay, the question is, is it possible for a person to grow spiritually, and we'll add, reach enlightenment without believing in the doctrine of karma? And without question, the answer is yes. The doctrine of karma is not meant to make you enlightened. The doctrine of karma helps you cope with worldly problems. As a, that's the purpose. The doctrine of karma really has no, this sounds strange, I've never used this language, watch this. The w doctrine of karma has no spiritual utility. Huh, really? Doctrine of karma won't make you enlightened. Absence of the doctrine of karma won't prevent you from being enlightened. No spiritual utility, but a very important worldly utility to cope with the ups and downs of life, to cope with tragedies, to cope with problems, problems which can pull you down. So to deal with those worldly problems we have this doctrine of karma. So I would say doctrine of karma has no spiritual role, but it has a very important worldly role. Does that, wor does that work for you? Okay. Let's take a couple more questions from online, and then I think we'll get ready to um, wrap up here. This is a question from Radhika, who lives in... Tiruvananthapuram. How's that? Not bad. <laughs> In Kerala. <laughs> Did I pronounce it correctly? I, I there. You live there. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. But is this a Tamilian word or, or, or Malayalam word? Okay. It, it modern, you know. The, the, the British called it Trivandrum. <laughs> Why did the British call it Trivandrum? They couldn't pronounce Tiruvananthapuram. <laughs> so anyway. Okay, and uh, Radhika's question is, when a, a living being expires only when their entire prarabdha karmas are fructified, or can death happen prior for fructification. We had that exact question last week, right? We said that death is due to karma, but there are two kinds of karma. One is prarabdha karma, and the other is the actions you do in this life. <laughs> so if the actions you do in this life are not healthy, <laughs> then you know, if, if you, d people kill themselves drinking alcohol. It's just amazing. I, I was trying to help a young man decades ago who was addicted to alcohol, and he died from liver failure associated with, with alcoholism. So look at this. Did he die because his prarabdha karma got exhausted? No. <laughs> he died because his karmas were unhealthy, his actions, his own actions. So, so, death is due to karma, but whenever we talk about karma, the, it's conventional to think only of past karmas. But that's only half the story, right? The other half of the story is the karmas we commit in this life. Don't ignore those karmas, okay? Um, Animesh asks a question. He lives in, uh, in West Bengal. 
My question is, <laughs> ooh, interesting. My question is, do you, referring to me, ever get anxious or insecure about the future of you or your ashram? Like, <laughs> what if the ashram ceases to exist in the future? Or what will happen to you? In reference to health, health issues in the near future. So, do I get anxious or insecure? Fortunately not. Um, what will happen in the future to this one or this one? <laughs> Who knows? You know, I have some minor health issues, but I have no life-threatening issues. So how long will I live? I have no idea. And then, what will happen to this ashram? People ask me, Swamiji, when you're no longer, what will happen to the ashram? I have no idea. <laughs> Not that I'm, don't get me wrong, I take care of my body, and I'm acting responsibly with regard to the future of the ashram, but there's no anxiety or insecurity involved because well, because of Vedanta in general but in particular is the loss of identification. This body is subject to old age and death. That's just a fact. I, can, I accept that fact without reservation. Why? What can you, well, first of all, what else, can, what can you do anyway? <laughs> Sorry to be a little, a little silly, but in a more Vedantic sense, you know, it's a thing. And the same is true about the mind. So these are things that behave according to nature. These are things which are part of the world. These are things upon which my peace and contentment do not depend. That's the, that's the bottom line. My sense of contentment, fulfillment, inner peace does not depend on the condition of the body, nor does it con depend on the condition of the mind, nor does it depend on the ashram. If the ashram burns down, you know, it's it's a problem for the insurance company. <laughs> you know, there, there's a wonderful story. Uh, Janaka is involved in this really heavy discussion, and his uh, servant comes in, the, f the kingdom is on fire. Uh, don't bother me. <laughs> so anyway, lack, absence of identification. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we talk about consciousness being unchanging and remaining, re you remain conscious even in deep sleep. We've had this discussion on several occasions. Consciousness doesn't turn on and off, being unchanging. It's, an it's a fundamental reality. Fundamental realities don't blink on and off. Consciousness is a fundamental reality. But now the question is, this uh, question, by the way, is from Neil. Neil lives in Atlanta, in Georgia. So he asks, what about someone who's in a coma? He says, or someone who is brain dead, or someone under general anesthesia. The light of consciousness in such person seems turned off. And how do you know that? If you're standing at the bedside, can you tell? You, you can't tell, right? <laughs> no, doctors can't tell. I mean, they try, they do their best. They, they connect you up to this ECG machine you know, in the all over your head and they try to measure your brain activity. And, but they don't know what you're expecting. <laughs> Such an important point. 
They don't know what you are experiencing. They know what your brain is doing, <laughs> but there is no way whatsoever to detect or measure your experience. So, if we ask, what does a person experience in a coma? What does a person experience if they're brain dead? What does a person experience if they're under general anesthesia? And we can answer that very s simply. They experience exactly what you experience in dreamless sleep. That's all it is. And how wonderful it is we can answer so clearly. What does it feel like to be dead? You already know. <laughs> And the irony is, we all love to sleep. <laughs> so if we all love to sleep, then why do, why do people fear death? I don't, anyway, that's, that, that's really not, <laughs> and that's really not the point here. But anyway, so, we'll take one more question, I think. Let us, let's see this one. Question, did I miss that? Where's that? Hmm? Uh, you know, we'll make this the uh, last question for today. Last week we had a discussion about acts of terrorism which kill, m result in mass casualties. And when a thousand people die 3,000 people on 9-11 die in a terrorist attack, can we say that is the result of their Prarabdha karma? And in our, in our discussion, prior discussion, absolutely not. As we said, two factors are involved. Past karmas, also current actions. In this case, the actions of 19 terrorists. The actions of 19 terrorists deprived those thousands of people of their natural lives. So the question is, and this is a question from uh, Stuart. Stuart asks, um, however, how do we tackle this, this question? Why did this happen to me and so not somebody else? Why me? Uh, is a question every victim can ask. Do we just say that they were simply at the wrong place in the wrong time? Why me? <coughs> I'm just reading the rest of the question. How about this? It's common for people to say, why me? Why did this happen to me? You know, I'm a good person. I don't hurt other people, so why did this tragedy happen to me? Health crisis, house burns down, whatever it is. Why me? I would turn it around and say, well, why not me? Am I the anointed one who is somehow special among everyone else? where I am somehow immune to the random problems of life. Is anyone immune to the random problems of life? So, you see my point. Instead of asking why, why me gives you a privileged position. Are you so special? None of us are so special to ask why me. No matter how pious you are, no matter how good you are, in the common meaning of that word, does that mean you're in a different category than the rest of us? And when you say, why me? It's like saying, it's okay if it happens to you. <laughs> But <laughs> it's, it's not okay if it happens. Come on! 
We are all, they're a nice American expression, we are all in the same boat. <laughs> Which means we are all equally subject to karma causing tragedies in our lives. Every single one of us, you've heard me say this before, every single one of us have been born with plenty of bad karma. Lots of good karmas, but a sufficient amount of bad karmas to cause real havoc in our lives. No one is born without that bad karma, which means it is guaranteed that disasters will take place in all of our lives. So, in response then to the question, why me? Very clearly, the correct question is, why not me? Am I so special that I should somehow be excluded from these normal kinds of human suffering? Very important. I'm glad the steward asked that question. And we'll conclude our satsang now and continue <coughs> next week. Again, if you have, uh, addressing our online students, <laughs> if you have questions you would like to be uh, considered in, in next week's satsang, please email me those questions and uh, we'll try to take them up. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma kashya dukha bhag bhavet asato ma sadgamaya tamaso ma jyotirgamaya mrityor ma amritangamaya om shanti 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 om tat sat see you next time